Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this presentation. Today, we are going to be talking about monitoring and logging your Kubernetes cluster using OpenStack Helm. Uh, before that, allow us to introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Nishant Kumar, and I'm currently working at Ericsson as a senior solution integrator. And hi, I'm Uday. I'm a solution architect with Ericsson. We both work on AT&T's integrated uh, and now known as Network Cloud. So let me set the tone for this talk. Uh, I'll be talking about Helm, giving you an overview, overview on Helm. Uh, then I'll be moving on to OpenStack Helm. Uh, then Uday will be presenting you about monitoring, uh, followed by a short demo. Then I'll be talking about logging, uh, again followed by a short demo. Uh, we would be dealing from the perspective of OpenStack Helm and not really diving into the internals of this component. So let's get started. So why Helm? Uh, before we start talking about what Helm does, uh, let us try to uh, understand uh, what problem does Helm tries to resolve for us. So let us look at an app from a Kubernetes point of view. So if you're trying to install uh, one of the OpenStack services uh, in a Kubernetes world, uh, what are the different Kubernetes objects that we would be needing? We would be needing maybe a deployment set, uh, a stateful set, a daemon set, a config map, service, and some other things as well. Now suppose you have successfully deployed this OpenStack service, and now you would like to make some configuration changes. What do you do? You go to this manifest file, edit those files and update it. Now suppose if you would want to repeat this step again and again and again. This becomes an overhead, an overhead that needs to be addressed, an overhead that needs to be taken care of. And thankfully, we have a tool that does that. And that is called Helm. Helm makes our lives easy. Helm templatizes our experience while interacting with Kubernetes cluster. So what is Helm? It is a Kubernetes package manager. And what does that mean? If I had to give you a simple technical analogy, I would be saying that what apt is to Ubuntu is what Helm is to Kubernetes. It's as simple as that. So you define your application within Helm via charts. So charts is the most fundamental concept within Helm. So if you're dealing with Helm, you're dealing with charts. And what is a chart? A chart is a collection of files that describes related Kubernetes resources. It can be used to install something very simple, or it can be used to install something really complex. So Helm gives you the power and mechanism to drive your application the way you want it. Update, rollback, and test application deployments. Now we all know it's a big pain to update, roll back, perform upgrades, testing those deployments, whether it be in your development environment or whether it be in your production environment. But with Helm, this whole complex process becomes really easy. And how it does that, we have a demo out there which Uday is going to show you while monitoring. And we'll be updating a very simple resource, but it will showcase with the ease which with Helm handles this complex problem. Now, taking a look at this diagram, uh, this gives an overview uh, of a Helm architecture and how it works. So Helm works as a client and a server model. So Helm client is a command line tool uh, for the end users. And then you have something called the Tiller server. So Tiller server is your server component for Helm, and it is installed as an in-cluster component within Kubernetes. So the process is Helm client talks to a Tiller server, it provides the charts to Tiller server, Tiller servers manages those charts, packages those charts, and then it interfaces with the Kubernetes API server and spawn or orchestrate those Kubernetes resources. And this is how Helm works. So the world of Helm. Now when you download uh, any chart or when you look at any Helm chart, suppose let's take an example that's a Keystone chart or it's an horizon chart or any glance chart. So each of these charts will have a similar structure. And now let's look one by one what are these. Starting with chart.yaml, uh, it has the information about the chart itself. Uh, suppose it will have like a name of the chart, description of the chart, the version of the chart, and some other things. Then you have the requirements.yaml. 
So requirements.yaml has a list of dependencies on which this chart depends. And then you have something called a charts directory. So charts directory will contain those charts which were reference backed in requirements.yaml. And now something called values.yaml. Now this particular file is the most important file in Helm. Unless you are trying to write your own Helm chart, you would end up interacting only with this file. This contains all the configuration changes that you would require to interact with Helm and spawn your Kubernetes resources. And then you have something called a templates directory. So templates directory has a collection of files, collection of YAML files. And these YAML files, when combined with your values.yaml, produces a valid Kubernetes manifest file. So let's take an example and have a look at it. So this is a values.yaml taken from the keystone. And I would like you to focus on the key replicas and then API, which has a value one. Uh, it, has a, it has a parent uh, key as well called the pod, but I'm not showing it because it has some other contents above that. But for now, just imagine you have pod, replicas, API, and the value with one. Now, how does we use the value in your templates file? So this is a snapshot from your keystone deployment YAML file. This is one of the files that is present under the template folder. You will have like a service file, a daemon set, a stateful set, and some uh, other files as well. But this is just the deployment file. And here you can see the left-hand side contains the key similar to your Kubernetes manifest file. But the difference comes under the right-hand side in the way the values have been mentioned or the values have been put out there. So here you're trying to reference dot values, dot pod, dot replicas, dot API. So dot values means you're trying to reference to the current context and you're trying to reference to the values.yaml. So now it is referencing to values.yaml, dot values, dot pod, dot replicas, dot API, and it gets substituted as the value one. Now, if you would like to have some other value, you do not need to interact with any of the template files or the YAML files present in the templates directory. You just need to go to the values.yaml file and you need to make your configuration changes. And that's how Helm eases your process. Now Helm plus OpenStack. Uh, now Helm already existed as a Kubernetes package manager. OpenStack started moving towards a Kubernetes deployment model, but someone thought to bring this together. And who was that someone? That someone was a team at at and who has done a great work in developing this OpenStack Helm project. It started as a POC, and then it turned out to be an uh, OpenStack official project in October 2017. So there are two separate projects. Uh, one is the OpenStack Helm. So it has charts for deploying uh, your OpenStack and its related services. So you will find charts for uh, NOAA, Keystone, Glance, and other OpenStack services. And then you'll find charts for it related services like RabbitMQ, LibWord, OpenVSwitch, etc. And then you have the second repository, which is the OpenStack Help Infra. Now it contains charts for Prometheus, FluentD, Elasticsearch, your NagOS, uh, Flannel, Calico, etc. So for from from the perspective of this talk, we are only going to focus on OpenStack Help Infra project uh, because it contains charts for monitoring and logging. And here, I'll pass on this presentation to Uday, uh, who's going to talk about monitoring. Imagine you're a captain of a ship. Recognize this guy? Well, if you want to monitor as to what is going on out in the sea, you could sit on the tower right up ahead and uh, see what are the threats that you may be facing. Uh, this, we can liken it to our OpenStack services, where people could get into it, we could face attacks, there could be issues, the services could go down. But sitting up on the tower, would we be able to see what is going on with the crew uh, on the ship? There could be a mutiny, which we could liken it to our Kubernetes cluster. The pods could go down at times, another pod could come up, the services may not be started properly. So uh, this is one of the issues. The third one could be that of there being a major issue with the ship and the ship by itself sinking. This again, we can liken it to the operating system. If the operating system isn't there, anything that's running on it could also go down with it, whether it be Kubernetes or OpenStack. 
So for uh, all three of them to be monitored and to be able to see that everything is working perfectly, we need a tool uh, to take care of it. And this would be sorted out by three of the first mate or the first officers of the ship who are reporting back to the captain. And this is sorted out by Prometheus. So Prometheus is an open source uh, software monitoring and alerting toolkit, uh, which was started off as Borgman in Google and later open sourced by the guys at SoundCloud in about around 2016. It's a multidimensional data model. Now, what is multidimensional? I'll come to it in a minute. Uh, essentially, it's a time series data identified at two levels. The first level is the metric and the second level is key value pairs. So for example, in a traditional uh, monitoring tool, you might have something such as some metrics such as HTTP request 400 for the 400 response, HTTP request 200 for the 200 response and multiple such metrics. Here, uh, uh, Prometheus goes ahead and sorts that out and kind of reduces it by having uh, multidimensional data. What is multidimensional data? It would have a metric known as HTTP request, and on the other hand, have key value pairs such as 400 and 200, link them both together to form multidimensional data. It essentially has a pull model over HTTP used for data collection. Now, uh, there, are, there is a huge debate as to what is better, a pull model and a pu versus a push model. But uh, the guys over at Prometheus have this to say that the node on which it is running, if that is down, sometime, sometimes the pull model works a lot better. If you want to know more about the advantages, you all can uh, look up at uh, Prometheus.io to find out more about why a pull model works better. The targets are discovered via two methods. The first one is service discovery. The second one is obviously static configuration. Uh, service discovery, we'll see later when we install uh, the exporters, such as OpenStack exporter, that uh, the services are discovered automatically. And uh, of course, once it is discovered, we need to be able to see the metrics, and the metrics are available on Prometheus' own UI, which provides a basic level of uh, being able to search for the metrics, and uh, so on. Let's take a look at what is the Prometheus architecture and how it enables us. Uh, at the heart of the system, we have the Prometheus server. So on the left-hand side, you see the retrieval system, the storage system, and the PromQL. These are the first three mates, or the first three officers I was talking about earlier. So the retrieval uh, system over here it has multiple capabilities. The first of them is service discovery. Service discovery, you could have Kubernetes, you could have OpenStack. As soon as the exporters are put in, all of them are discovered. The metrics are available automatically. Uh, the second is that of the push gateway. We just spoke about pull method and why pull method is much better. Why this again, why do we need a push gateway at all? Well, uh, there, there may be some short-lived jobs such as being uh, needing to delete users in a batch job which is not node specific. Perhaps uh, users on an entire application we want to delete, create new ones or make such modifications which are not node specific. Then push uh, gateway and short-lived push jobs are a great way to do it as long as they're not abused and they're not used extensively when it becomes a kind of a, uh, a bottleneck. The third one is that of job exporters. We want multiple things to be uh, monitored, could be SNMP, could be Prometheus, uh, Kubernetes, could be OpenStack. And for that very purpose, we have job exporters which help us in expanding, ever expanding uh, world of uh, applications and things to monitor, job exporters come in handy. The fourth is that of the Prometheus server. When we need to scale, we need to have multiple Prometheus servers talking to each other uh, to be able to scale and uh, monitor multiple applications or services and Prometheus server comes into play. The second officer over here is that of the storage. So uh, what Prometheus does is it takes in the data that was ingested to it in the past two hours and uh, stores it on a local on the local disk or local storage and goes on accumulating such files. Uh, obviously, if we want long-term storage, we can integrate with uh, other databases, MySQL, MongoDB, uh, PostgreSQL, so on. The third is that of the PromQL. It is Prometheus's custom uh, query language, which offers certain capabilities of being able to search better and uh, query better. Uh, and uh, this is what is used by various uh, applications, whether its own web UI or Grafana, to uh, go ahead and get the data and display the metrics. Now, Prometheus needs some uh, helping hand in being able to push notifications across. The, uh, to be able to push notifications to pager duty, email, so on, we use the alert manager. So apart from the Prometheus exporter, let's find out what 
the exporters can do and how specifically to open stack what uh, are the capabilities so prometheus uh, exporter to introduce is for gathering open stack api derived metrics as is obvious from the name and uh, it leads to automatic discovery by the prometheus server once the exporter is installed so we can see some metrics which are uh, truncated over here and which is shown uh, so before we go ahead and have Prometheus installed or the exporter, let's look at, uh, let's tie it back to uh, the Helm charts and what is there. So this is a small snapshot of some part of the Prometheus values.yaml. We see replicas has been put to one, revision uh, history, the pod replacement strategy, uh, rolling updates, max surge, unavailable, so on. So, and uh, these, these are some, uh, this is just a snapshot to give you an idea of what is available. It's, it's a pretty large uh, uh, Helm chart that is available for Prometheus. Next is that for the Prometheus OpenStack exporter. Uh, similar configurations are available for the Prometheus OpenStack exporter as well, uh, but I've taken uh, another section to display what other capabilities capabilities are there within, what are the configurations are there rather of the OpenStack exporter and that is the OS polling interval, timeout seconds, OS retries. Importantly, we want to see the secrets. We can have multiple uh, user secrets from Keystone identity uh, configured over here so that Prometheus can automatically monitor certain uh, metrics as well. Now coming to the OpenStack metrics. Uh, these are some sample metrics. You can go on to GitHub, ATT, Comdev, and look at some of the metrics. There are simple API monitoring uh, things that we have right for, for all the services from Neutron to Glance, uh, several metrics. Uh, as far as uh, uh, being able to know if a sh NOVA scheduler is down, the compute is disabled to what percentage, what services, so on and so forth as well, the OpenStack metrics are available. Now, uh, you may ask me, okay, I have metrics. I can see the metrics. There are some metrics which come with it, but I want to be able to enhance it for my own group or organization or for my own needs. How do I do it? The first and the foremost is uh, if you have the repo, you can go into check osapi.py add your API map to it. So you can see a bunch of uh, services that have uh, already have their mapping, uh, Nova, Neutron, the common ones. So for example, let's take a new application, new OpenStack project that you want monitored. You can go ahead and add it over here. Uh, now we want to add the respective component library as well. So you have added a certain uh, number of metrics. You have to ensure that in the main.py that is added. Suppose you want a new application completely, then you would have to add the file for that particular uh, component as well. So for example, you, you, let's take an application such as uh, Deckhand or uh, say uh, uh, Armada, we would have to add those in as well. We spoke about uh, some major things, needs of what Prometheus needs to do. One is obviously Kubernetes. Kubernetes is one of those exporters which is officially maintained by Prometheus as well and uh, is discovered automatically. This is just a snapshot of some of the metrics that are available by, uh, with uh, Kubernetes itself. So we see persistent volume metrics, cube node status, uh, capacity, uh, CPU cores, etc. Finally, the more important uh, one is we always, whatever work we need, uh, we do, we need to be able to show it. And that is where visualization comes into play. Uh, we have Grafana, a whole bunch of uh, features. Uh, just it, we can visualize, it helps in alerting. Uh, we can send notifications across, create dynamic dashboards, uh, mix data sources, annotations, create ad hoc filters. And here's a snapshot of how Grafana looks. Now we'll uh, move ahead to show, combine all of this to show you a small demo of uh, how this works. So logged into the server, I'm just going to show you the file structure. Uh, we see various files, chart.yaml, requirements, requirements.yaml, values.yaml, which we spoke about and Nishant touched upon. Then let's look at the Prometheus uh, uh, templates as well. Templates, we see various uh, files such as the stateful set, services.yaml, the pod helm test, the ingress files, so on. You can dig deeper into what each of these are. Then let's go ahead, find out uh, how, we, how to install them. Uh, but before that, we want to look at the, uh, importantly, the values.yaml of Prometheus. So uh, within 
uh, prometheusvalues.yaml. As I said, uh, I had shown a snapshot. This is a, a better view of it. We can see various uh, uh, sections over here, the pod, affinity, life cycle, the number of replicas. Uh, importantly, the number of replicas, uh, we can increase that. We can see if, uh, how that affects it as well. Uh, we can see the termination periods, uh, the timeout that is available, the resources uh, in terms of limits in memory, and so on. Now let us go ahead and try to install it. So first of all, we'll be installing Prometheus itself. So a simple command with helm install Prometheus uh, dot slash the folder name and the namespace. Namespace will be setting it to OpenStack. And voila, it has come up. We can see the pods, the IPs have been assigned uh, for both Prometheus and uh, the very uh, basic built-in PROM metrics that is available. We can see the port as well to which uh, we can connect the 9090 port and we'll be able to see the Prometheus UI. Uh, also, there is the config map, uh, which has come up, the service account, which has come up. Now, let us uh, go ahead and install the other uh, things. But before that, let's also check uh, with the Helm status to see whether these same things are reflecting within the Helm status. So within Helm status, we can again see that there are the, uh, the single pod that we had co configured is up and running. The, the Prometheus stateful set is also there and the ingress is also displayed. Now we'll go ahead and install uh, the Prometheus uh, node exporter, which will look at the uh, basic uh, metrics on each and every node. Again, pointing to the uh, respective folder and keeping the namespace th as the same. So the namespace is OpenStack. Yet again, we can see uh, various things such as the pod coming up, uh, the config map being there, the service account is uh, there, the, uh, the cluster binding can be seen, and the service is also up, and uh, the service uh, has its uh, port assigned through which it will communicate with Prometheus. Next, let's install the others. We will uh, start off with installation of the KH metrics, or the KH exporter in this case. So we'll go into the cube state metrics, keep the namespace the same, and let's see what turns up. Again, various things such as the services, the clusters, the cluster role binding, the services with its IP and ports assigned, and the deployment state is all shown over here. Next, we will install the OpenStack, the Prometheus OpenStack exporter. Keeping the namespace as the same. Here again, uh, various details of the deployment can be seen right from its installation time, the role binding, the roles, the service accounts, the services, and the deployment. So service, we can see, again, the IP is assigned to the pod. Next, we will install Grafana, of course, as the last one, to have the UI up and running. Namespace, again, will be kept as OpenStack. Here again, we can see the various things assigned, such as the service and the service uh, IP and port. The role binding is given. The ingress is also mentioned. The node port, as I mentioned earlier, 3000, the port is mentioned, the deployment is given, 
the age of the deployment, the number of ports. Now let's go into Grafana and see if there are metrics available for these various, uh, from these various uh, exporters that we have installed. First, let, let us, but before that, we need to find out if the data source is available. In a manual installation, you'll have to go ahead and add the data source. Here it is automatically discovered and it is available when it is done through Helm. That is because all of this is configured within Helm. Let's look at some of the node metrics. We can see things like idle CPU, the memory usage, the disk IO, the network received, and the network transmitted. Now we will look at the Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes are a cluster as well. We can see the control plane is up. The scheduler is up. All the services are up. You can see the utilization. Now we'll look at the OpenStack services. We can see all, that all the OpenStack services, Neutron, Nova, Ceph, and the others are all up and running. The vCPUs and its metrics can be seen. The RAM, the disk, all of these can be seen. Some of them, whatever is not configured, it just says no data. Now we'll do a simple use case. We will go ahead and make a change to the number of replicas that we have, uh, that we want to update. So instead of one, we will increase the number. We will again update the Helm via the Helm upgrade command. So it is simple as Helm upgrade Prometheus, pointed to the folder. And well, it has come up. We can see that the desired state is three. It's come up to two. So essentially the pods are started. With that, we will move on to logging and I will pass it on to Nishant. Okay, thanks Uday. That was really a short and a sweet demo. So moving towards logging. Uh, so imagine uh, you are stuck in a tiny raft uh, in the middle of the ocean and all you see is deep pristine blue waters uh, with no land in sight. Uh, from an ops engineer perspective, uh, this is the kind of feeling uh, when you view logs at different levels. Uh, now with microservices uh, coming into the picture with Kubernetes, uh, the number of logs have increased rapidly uh, and managing them have become really complex and cumbersome. Uh, so how do we find a reliable solution for uh, your logging? Uh, so let's find out and let's see if the ops engineer uh, could find a land in this ocean of containers. So this is a pictorial representation of how our logging solution will look like. Uh, now taking a look at these components and let's try to understand each one of them. Uh, so you need a component uh, who's going to collect your logs. So if you have thousand nodes, there needs to be a component which will go to those thousand nodes and collect those logs. Uh, now which is that component? It's FluentD. So FluentD is a log processor, log forwarder and your log aggregator. Uh, now, once you have collected all these logs, you would want to store it somewhere. Uh, and for storing, we have something called Elasticsearch. Uh, and Elasticsearch is a bit smarter than just storing it. Uh, it stores them in an index manner, uh, which makes it highly efficient when you're trying to search it. So Elasticsearch becomes our storage and your search engine. Uh, now, obviously, we wouldn't want to view the logs in the raw format in ten and thousands of lines. We would definitely love to see uh, these logs in terms of tables and in terms of charts. Uh, so for that, we have Kibana, and it is a, a dashboard for logging. Uh, so let's look at a little bit in detail about these components. So as I was talking about the uh, log collection part, in OpenStack Helm Infra, uh, we are using two different projects. Uh, these two different projects are Fluent Bit and Fluent D. Uh, so these two projects are maintained by the company called Treasure Data. Uh, and these two projects have a lot of similarities. Uh, but let's try to understand why are we using two projects. Uh, 
so Fluent Bit is a very lightweight log processor and a log forwarder. Uh, it doesn't have really strong log aggregation capabilities. Uh, as you can see, it just occupies uh, 450 KB of memory. Uh, so, so when you're trying to collect logs from containers, uh, it really meets our purpose. We want something really lightweight to run on those nodes and collect these logs. Uh, and Fluent Bit uh, meets our demands. Uh, now, on the other hand, you have FluentD, which is again a log processor and a log forwarder, uh, but it has a high log aggregator capabilities. Uh, so we will try to uh, have a, both these projects in place where Fluent Bit is going to uh, process and forward these logs to FluentD, uh, and then FluentD is going to aggregate these logs and then pass it to Elasticsearch. So now let's try to understand what happens when you install FluentD via Helm. Uh, this is a visualization of what are the Kubernetes resources that are created. Uh, so as we had discussed that Fluent Bit uh, is your log processor and your log uh, forwarder. So it is going to run as a daemon set. So if you have suppose 10 nodes, uh, Fluent Bit would be running on all of those 10 nodes. If you have another node that is added up, Fluent Bit automatically will run on those uh, extra node. And then you have and then you have Fluent D. So Fluent D since it only takes care about the log aggregation part, so you can just use a deployment uh, Kubernetes object uh, uh, for installing it. Uh, you have something called the config maps. Uh, now you need uh, configuration files for Fluent Bit and configuration files for Fluent D. Uh, so we use config maps by mounting the volumes. Then you have something called the secrets. Uh, so secret here is being used in your Fluent D pods uh, because uh, it contains the Elasticsearch username and password uh, since Fluent D is going to forward these logs to Elasticsearch. And then again, you have the FluentD service. It is going to uh, view all of these pods and associate all of these pods within itself. Uh, and again, uh, you have a values.yaml file to manipulate all these resources. So values.yaml file is kind of a centralized configuration files. Uh, and you could manipulate uh, all of these resources just by interacting with your values.yaml. So since we have been talking a lot about the values.yaml file and the importance of it, uh, let's try to look at this sample uh, snapshot that has been taken from your fluent bit values.yaml file and fluent bit.conf. Uh, so this is what happens uh, prior to the installation or deployment and after the deployment. Uh, so the parameters used here and the uh, configuration options that are here uh, are more specific to fluent D. Uh, I won't be going into much details, but uh, there's a very o good official documentation available, uh, which will explain you these parameters and also the other parameters that are supported, but I'll just give an overview. So Fluent Bit configuration file is divided into different sections. Uh, so the first section is for the service itself. Uh, the second section is your input section, and this is where you define your source. So here we are trying to uh, capture logs from the var log container star dot log. So this is your input. This is where from you will collect all the logs. There are some other options uh, as well, uh, but uh, moving ahead, we'll talk about the cube filter. So, so Fluent Bit uh, does provide us uh, filter plugins. Uh, in this case, we also have a Kubernetes filter. So when you collect logs from these nodes, uh, the filter does is it adds extra metadata uh, related to Kubernetes. So it will add something like a pod ID, it will add like a namespace, it will add like the container ID uh, and some other Kubernetes related information. Uh, and now, as we said that Fluent Bit is going to forward these logs to Fluent D. Uh, in the output section, we have the Fluent D host and the Fluent D port. And then this is what gets converted when you do Helm install Fluent Bit. On the right hand side, what you're seeing is a Fluent Bit.conf, which is running inside your uh, uh, fluent bit pod. So the conversion happens uh, with the magic with which OpenStack Helm Infra has been written. So, hmm. now talking about Elasticsearch. So, as we had discussed, Elasticsearch is a very strong storage and your search engine. Uh, it has some uh, concepts. So, let us look at some of the key concepts involved in Elasticsearch. So you have something called a cluster. So a cluster is a collection of nodes. Um, and a node is a single Elasticsearch instance. 
and then you have index so within index you would uh, like to store similar documents uh, and then this index could be divided into shards and replicas so sometimes uh, your index can be huge it can be lots of terabytes uh, so you would want them so it wouldn't fit into a single server so what you would want them is to divide into multiple nodes and those index when they are divided is what is called shards and each shard is self capable of handling any data requests that are incoming then you have something then you have different types of nodes uh, within elastic search uh, when you install elastic search through openstack helm infra there are three types of pod that comes up uh, so one is the elastic search client uh, which is used to handle your uh, client request then you have an elastic search master uh, it takes care of the cluster state and your cluster health uh, and then you have something called the elastic search data so this node is going to store all your data and probably you what you would want to do is um, configure the memory uh, a bit higher so that you would won't run out of memory issues so now looking at kibana so kibana since we had already discussed this is just a dashboard it is again very powerful uh, you can search view and interact with your el uh, elastic search indices and also it can perform a lot of uh, advanced uh, data analysis so this is just a snapshot taken from uh, the kubernetes uh, deployment and this is how the logs can be seen so now let's have a quick demo since we are running out of time so as you can see here these are the structure within the fluent uh, logging directory you have charts.yaml templates values.yaml uh, let's look at the values.yaml file uh, you have some general configurations uh, like your images and your labels but one of the most con important configuration file is your uh, fluent bit conf it is one important section which i had shown you in this slide as well so here is the section where you can uh, define your own logs and you can define your own sources and your inputs and outputs now you have something called the templates folder and as you could see template folder is a collection of multiple yaml files and it is similar to your kubernetes yaml file uh, you have your service fluentd yaml you have your daemon set and deployment set and some other resources as well now let's go ahead and install fluentd so again it's a very simple command just a one line command where you give the name of the uh, service or the name of the chart not the service uh, you give the path towards the chart and you give your namespace and there it is the resources have started coming up you can see the pods you have five pods running fluent bit fluentd you have elastic search uh, template pod as well you have a deployment which was the fluentd you have a daemon set for fluent bit and then you have a service for fluent logging now let us look at elastic search again with the same directory structure and again it has a values.yaml file which you can make your own configuration changes i would recommend if you are trying to gather uh, logs from a large deployment uh, you can uh, make some changes regarding the memory here and you can see uh, the master data and the client nodes being configured with different values so now let's go ahead and install elastic search as well again the command is pretty simple pretty explanatory so you give the name you give the path and again the namespace we are going to install it in the same namespace and there it is your resources have started getting created you have a service three different services running you have a cluster role you have config maps you have again pods for client master and data nodes and then you have a stateful set as well the data node will be a stateful set since it stores data and then you have a deployment a client and master will just be deployment
Now let's go ahead and see what's there in Kibana. Again, you have the same directory structure. Kibana doesn't have a lot of template files, maybe te deployment and then the service, some of the important files out here. And again, we would be installing Kibana using the same command line, just changing the name and the path to the chart repo. So you could see it's pretty simple. Uh, the way OpenStack Helm and OpenStack Helm Infra has been written, uh, it's really simple to install your services on your Kubernetes cluster. And so again, this as well has started coming up and it uses ingress since it has a dashboard you would like to interact from your external cluster. It got a node port as well. And then it has a deployment. Now let's look if the pods are up and running or not. We'll just run the get pods command in your OpenStack namespace. And you would see that the Elasticsearch, Fluent Bit, Fluent D pods are up and running. And then you also have a Kibana pod, which is up and running. We'll have a look at the Kibana dashboard. We have done some tunneling, but you can always use ingress and configure it for an external IP. So this is the Kibana dashboard. And by default, the way the chart has been written, you already have an index, which is already present and has been configured. And it has details about Kubernetes related to uh, the Kubernetes pod ID, the Docker ID, uh, and some other information as well. And if you want to view the logs, you can go into the discover section. And you could see here that the Kubernetes logs have started coming up. You could see there are some Ceph logs and this is pretty much it. I think we are out of time. And thank you. Thank you guys for listening out. So to summarize it, if you have any questions, we can take it up after this uh, offline. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, and to summarize this, Helm Charts makes our life easier, whether it is in monitoring or logging. And uh, hopefully you all get the time and uh, explore more about what Helm Charts is and how it can help your group and your organization. Thank you. Thank you.